Shalom, brothers and sisters. When I was creating the Thursday Thought today, it ended up being about 45 minutes long, which was just ridiculously too long. I was able to trim it up quite a bit, but I would like to present to you a portion that was cut out that I feel stands better on its own. I don't like having an org chart because I don't want to start a new church personally. We're here to build the kingdom of God, but I know there's a lot of people who want a church. And so prayerfully, I put together this, this org chart and, and Alan has helped me with it. And you'll notice when looking at it, it's, it's kind of divided into two different sections here. We have the Fellowship of Christ, the ecumenical movement, and we have the Church of Jesus Christ. And of course, even in the kingdom of God, we're going to have to have people, we're going to have to have congregations, way for people to get together and, and, and meet in, in Christ. Not everybody's going to join the existing churches. And there are people who want the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship to be a church church. But we are a creedless church. We are a, we do not have dogmas in, in our church, in, in, our, in our movement, however you want to say it. And so really, there's needs that, that have to be met here. We need leadership and training. We need to, as an ecumenical movement, unify the saints. We need missionaries. The Lord's always calling missionaries. And we need to establish some sort of an organization so that people can meet in congregations with other people so that they can worship together and fellowship in Christ. That's, that's one of the major purposes of what we're doing. And the Lord has told us for quite some time that the first the Council of Elders is what's supposed to be the leadership, if you will, the top facilitators, the way I prefer to say it, for this movement. And that is two co-presidents, the first elder and elect lady, prophet and prophetess. And then the, the rest of the council are the two apostles co-presidents, the two co-presidents of the seven evangelists, or you know, which are the presidency of the 70, and then the matriarch and patriarch of the fellowship, and then a friend of the fellowship or a lay member, so that we have someone there who can express the needs of the saints in general. I know some people who don't like titles, but the reality is that, you know, if you get a job in construction, someone isn't going to call you a nurse or a healthcare worker. If you get a job in healthcare, no one's going to call you a welder. We have titles to express the callings that the Lord gave us, not to brag about ourselves. And so if you look at the chart, this is the way that the Lord has set it up in the scriptures and the way that the Lord has, has asked us to set this up. In the leadership and training column, we have the first presidency and we have the council of 50. And together, the first presidency will oversee the school of the prophets and also help oversee the council of elders, which will break down these other groups. Over the second column, we have, or in the second column, I should say, we have the apostles who are ambassadors. The way that the fellowship is set up, if we you know, get to a point to where we have the right amount of people, we're really going to have 24 apostles because we're going to have 12 apostles in the brotherhood of Christ and 12 apostles in the sisterhood of Christ. And it may be more because we may have people called to the order of the ministry version of the 12 apostles which is the one that actually does, does the, the work for everybody, not just the, the brothers or the sisters, who are non-binary. And non-binary apostles would be called straight to the owners of the ministry. They would not be a part of the, or not necessarily, I should say. If they don't identify as a male or a female, then if they are called as an apostle, they would fall directly into the 12 apostles, the quorum of the 12 apostles for the order of the ministry. And either way, that's really not enough people to service the entire world because we have people all over the world in every continent that consider themselves members of the fellowship. And we're very small, but obviously very spread out. And so because of that, the apostles, the quorum of apostles in the order of ministry has the ability to call 70 elders as it talks about in the book of the law of the Lord. And these 70 elders are there to assist, just like the Council of 50 is there to assist the First Presidency, in the unification of the saints. So this is a tight group of, of you know, not a ton of people here. You know, we've got 50 people in the Council of 50. And this is like at max. I feel very strongly we should have 
uh, a first presidency of five people. And so we're going to have, we'll say, 24 to 27 apostles and then 70 elders. So that's, that's less than 200 people to, to service the entire world. But it's all that's really needed for these two columns. You really don't need more than that for a unification movement or for leadership and training. But then you have this other side where it's, you know, this, the, the church, if you will, the, the organization of saints in local areas. And with that, you have a bridge being the seven evangelists and the 70. These are the missionaries. These are the evangelists. And, and I am using the term evangelist in the more traditional definition, and that would be as a missionary. The definition of evangelist, just so you know, is a person who seeks to convert others to the Christian faith. And I know that in the Latter-day Saint movement, there are some traditions that we call a patriarch or a matriarch an evangelist. And technically, you could say everybody is an evangelist because we all, in our own ways, call people to Christ. In the Fellowship of Christ, we're not using the term evangelist that way. We call a patriarch and a matriarch a patriarch and a matriarch. We call a missionary an evangelist. And based on what we've read in the Book of the Law of the Lord, the members of the First Presidency are first and second degree apostles. The apostles, or ambassadors, are third degree apostles. And the seven evangelists are fourth degree apostles. And under them are 70. And there can be up to 70 groups of 70s. So there can be a lot of them. These are the people that would go out to do the missionary work. These are the people that can start branches locally, start congregations locally. And as they do, and, and these grow, then they can get together and become a stake. Members from these congregations and branches will form a stake high council to help facilitate the needs of these congregations and branches. You get enough stakes together and you have an area high council. And then that leads up to the presiding high council. And the presiding high council is overseen by the fellowships, patriarch and matriarch. And they would work with the first presidency to call the lay member or friends of the fellowship to also be there with us in the council of elders. So basically the evangelists, the seven evangelists and the 70, they're kind of the bridge between the ecumenical movement and the church. And the patriarch and matriarch that oversees the presiding high council are really the, the parents, if you will, the mother and the father of the church. Now, obviously, the true leader of the church is Jesus Christ. This is the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship. But as far as the church side of things, instead of saying we have a president, the Lord has asked us to set this up like a family unit so that we can be a kingdom of God and not just a traditional church of man. I, I hope that makes sense. So then with the Council of Elders facilitating for the entire movement, and then we are all, of course, led by Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, Savior, and King. But it's divided out based on the needs of the kingdom of God. Because the Lord has told us in Revelation that the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian fellowship is the very kingdom of God. We're not supposed to exclude anyone. And here's the interesting thing. You don't have to be a member to be in the fellowship. Because the Lord has called us to be an ecumenical movement. And the whole purpose of the church is to help facilitate that growth and that change as we move from the church to the kingdom. The way the Lord is setting this up, I, I know we're really small, and this is a lot for an organization that's so small, but the way the Lord is setting this up is done in such a way that no one gets excluded. And we all can be Latter-day Saints as part of a greater movement. You can be in your own congregation, an independent congregation, a non-denominational Latter-day Saint congregation, and not have anything to do with a stake high council or an area high council or the presiding high council and not be a part of the church and just work directly with the 70 as part of the ecumenical movement. And, and in that instance, it would have to work through the 70 because it's a small one congregation. We don't have, even at max capacity, even if we had all the people that we needed right now, we're not going to have enough people because there's only going to be a hundred people in the unification of the saints column at max. 
that's not enough to, to help facilitate every single independent congregation. They're there more for the larger churches. But there would be enough 70. And so because of that, the 70 could be there to help these independent churches. So now the question becomes, what does any of this have to do with the School of Prophets? Well, I, I give you this information, this, this org chart, if you will, because we need to know what we're growing into. And, and I want you to know, I want you to notice that this is very, very loose. We definitely have callings, and they're traditional callings. They're, they're callings that, that most Latter-day Saints and even most Christians will be familiar with to some degree. But there is no specific way to set up a branch or a congregation or a stake. We know that there needs to be, for a branch, at least a pastor. And if they have enough people, they would call either a first deacon or a deacon, teacher, or priest to assist them. And we know that we need people in the high council. That would be high priest, elder, priest, or priestess, or teacher. But beyond this, it's really based on the needs of the congregation. We don't we don't need to create an org chart and then say, okay, we got to fill these people in. We got to get somebody for this. We got somebody for this. We got to get somebody for this. No, what we need to do, and, and what all churches really should do and organizations in general should do is say what are the needs of the people there's a, a story that i love about this preacher he writes the sermon of his lifetime I and mean, this is just the best sermon he's ever written he he feels god's hand in this he just knows like this is this is the one like this is the one that's going to make his mark on the world when people hear this it's just going to change everything and he goes to bed saturday night just so full of spirit and so happy he cannot wait for the next day, for Sunday, for, for his service. And he's got a big congregation. He gets up and there was a blizzard while he was sleeping. And the only person that's able to make it is the local farmer because, you know, he's got the equipment to drive in the snow. So he looks at the farmer and he says, brother, I, I wrote the best sermon of my life last night. And you're the only one that showed up. I, I don't know what I should do. And the farmer said, if only one cow shows up, I feed him. He said, okay. So he gets up and he, he just pours his heart out for two and a half hours. And the farmer sits there and takes it all in. And he, he's got passion. He's got the Holy Spirit. He's got everything he wrote out. It's just, it's just amazing. And when he gets done, he's just so excited. He was able to let all that out. He looks at the farmer and he says, so, what do you think? And the farmer looks at him and says, when that one cow shows up, I don't give him all the feed. That's the way I see the needs of the fellowship as we move forward. Every branch, we, we don't need to create, a, this is an American expression, but we don't need to create a McDonald's where everywhere you go, the Big Mac is exactly the same. What we need to do is figure out what is it that this group of people, this congregation, this branch, this stake, what are their needs? And then the facilitators step in and they say, okay, well, who is called to do this? Because we are a bottom-up organization. When a, congregate, when, a, when a group of people come together at the branch or a congregation, they go to the Lord and they decide, we feel the Holy Spirit saying that this brother or sister is the one it's supposed to be the pastor, or if it's a congregation that's large enough, these are the brothers and sisters that we feel are called to be in the bishopric. And then a member of the 70 of the stake high council goes and verifies this with, with the Lord. Remember how Aaron was called. Aaron was told to leave and go to Moses before, and according to the plates of brass, in chapter 6 of 3rd Moses, before Moses told, was told that Aaron was called. And while he's on his way there, Moses is talking to the Lord at the burning bush. And the Lord tells him, hey, Aaron's on his way. He can't wait to see you. Aaron's going to help you out. So two witnesses. Aaron's called by God directly. And then Moses is told by the Lord, yes, Aaron is called. I'm already sending him here. So this isn't something where I... As the first elder, 
Say, okay, you people are called, now go call other people. As the Lord calls people, they will step forward and, and notify us of their call. The congregations they're in will sustain them. And then the people that are there to facilitate, whether it be the 70 or the stake high council, will be there to verify. And, there, and thereby, by the mouths of two or three witnesses, these things will be established and everyone will be called just as Aaron was called. So I hope this helps you understand better kind of how an organizational structure can look like for the fellowship as we grow. Obviously, none of this is written in stone. This is basically just kind of a, an, an idea based on what the Lord has given us thus far. Like I said previously, at the end of the day, it's really about the needs of the people, not the needs of the organization. So this kind of gives us a loose goal to move towards. And in the meantime, let's unite in Christ and see where the Lord takes us.